We continue on with week two, part two of Revolution. And I would like to give a disclaimer uh, at this point. Uh, in no way are we as a church or me personally endorsing the watching of this film. Uh, rather, uh, Satan has a tendency to take things um, that are good and turn them into evil. And so this is my way of taking some things Satan probably meant for evil and turning them into good. And so we'll look at some of the positive elements uh, in the show. Viewer discretion is advised, but I'm not naive, and I know that most of you have seen the show already, because I polled you guys before we started this series. So we've got some good t context to talk about uh, the book of James. We're going to pick it up in verse 19, so if you've got your Bibles or something to uh, read that uh, with, then please uh, uh, turn uh, there or push the right buttons on your phone or electronic device because fortunately for us that has not happened and so we can make use of electricity and power otherwise in this room in particular it would be extremely dark right now at this moment all right so last time uh, we talked about uh, the theme of the book overall we talked about James a little bit in the purpose of the book the time period the understanding the goal here or the challenge that James is is putting out there for his church remember he's a pastor he's a, a leader in Christian circles which are still very small Christianity is still a very uh, regional um, happening and occurrence it is of course spreading throughout the Roman world but uh, that takes time there's no internet there's no airplanes uh, there are no cars there are no railroads and so everything is traveling by camel uh, by foot by ship and so it's taking time for the gospel to be spread and so James says we need to have a revolution in our lives and we need to throw out the old we need to usher in the new and by throwing out the old, we're talking about the old sin nature, the way that, that we're kind of do things if left to ourselves, if left to our own devices. And James is drawing a line in the sand and he's saying, this is a new way to live. This is a new way to be. And there ought to be some outward signs of the transformation that's happened inwardly inside of us. And so he begins to de detail out for us what those signs look like uh, so that as he follows Christ, he is lead, he's trying to demonstrate that following uh, to those people in his church. And so here we are doing the same thing, trying to follow Christ, understand who he was, what he's commanded us to do, and try to cut through all of the, the religious language and through all of the, the cultural beliefs about Christianity and get to what's actually true, which is always, always the challenge. It's kind of like if you ever watch a commercial and you're trying to figure out what's actually true about the product that's being advertised, it can be kind of challenging. Because uh, then at the end, it's all of a sudden, it sounds like this. You know, and they say some kind of thing about how it's going to kill you and you're going to get a heart attack and die if you use this product. Which makes no sense to me, but you know, I'm not in charge of that, so I don't know what to say. Let's look at verse 19, where it says, My dearly loved brothers, understand this. Everyone must be quick to hear slow to speak, and slow to anger. All right, so three things. Let's all, let's kind of get those in our mind. I think this is a great verse to memorize. All right, this is worth, not that other verses aren't worthy. If you're like Sophie, you've got the whole thing memorized, and Ethan. But if you're not like that, uh, and then you just have, can just remember one verse, then let's, let's kind of commit this to memory. We need to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Let's all of us say that together. We need to be quick to hear, Oh, come on now. We need to be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. All right, great job. Great job. All right, you guys are definitely with me now, at least for the next 30 seconds. And then, in the kind of the conclusion part of that section, for man's anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Hmm. Think about that. E even if you're right, even if... Um, there's really nothing wrong with your position or what you're saying. God doesn't need our anger. He needs us to be slow to speak, quick to hear, and slow to become angry. And this is a challenge, all right? Many of us, we are quick to become angry. 
And so we have to work at that, and we, we have to create a new default response. You know, we all kind of have default responses, right? Just the way that we're kind of pre-programmed to respond, usually through a conditioning, uh, maybe from our parents, maybe from a favorite show that we watch or a childhood hero. And so we kind of take these personality characteristics, and so there are these switches that get pulled, or there are these catalysts that happen, and then we just go from uh, completely calm and fine to just infuriated and the adrenaline's running and and so in that moment we can't really necessarily change that chemical reaction that's happening in in our body but what we can change is what comes out of our mouth right we can change that we can choose to act in spite of how our the chemicals in our body are telling us to respond and that's what James is telling us to do he's saying that we need to be slow to speak and slow to become angry now, now what's our natural default it's the opposite, right? I mean, we're always quick to speak. We always want to share our opinion, tell everybody what we think, you know, gab in, get in on, you know, post our Twitter or whatever, tweet or whatever we're going to do to react to some conversation. Really being silent, that's not our first thought. But it's something that we need to learn. That needs to become our first thought is to, to be silent. Now, I wonder why that is. Why would it be a good, I mean, let's just reason that out for a minute. Why would it be good to not just immediately respond verbally to something. You can't take back what you say. All right, good. What else? And we don't respond out of emotion. Good. All right. So both both very valid points. Yeah, we sometimes we're just not it takes us time to really put together a rational response. We can we can respond irrationally pretty quickly. But to put together the right kind of response, and a godly response, and a, a response that's been sharpened and conditioned in the right way, that takes a little bit of time. And so, the Holy Spirit warns us through the book of James to be slow to speak, slow to become angry, and that we ought to listen. Because many times we jump to conclusions, don't we? We all do it. We stereotype people. We, stere we, we expect uh, what we're going to hear is coming. Uh, you know, uh, in marriage, a lot of times, especially if you're married for a long time, Stephanie and I, we do this sometimes. It's usually me because Stephanie's just pretty well perfect. I mean, she's like just one step under Jesus. But um, I will sometimes think I know what she's going to say or how she's going to react, and I will go ahead and, and, and kind of hear her saying it without her even saying it at all. And then she'll say something completely different, and I'll hear what I expected to hear, and then shazam. You know, I'm on it like a, I don't know, a beast in a, I don't know, something. I don't have to come up with a good saying there. I'm not sure what to say. But I'm on it like a fly in sandpaper. There you go. Um, and so I, I just can't, I'm going to get stuck, and I get cut off because, yeah, my poor wife, she's just praying that all, you know, the sermon will end soon. And so we have to be quick, we have to be careful that we don't get stuck in that sticky situation. So let's, see, let's go on, let's see what's next. Therefore, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and evil excess, humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save you. And one of the biggest problems that we see in the show in the DV series Revolution is that whenever the power goes off and governments collapse and and services you know like police and and hospital services and fire response when those things go away we lose something a, as a society and when we are not living by some type of law by some type of moral standard moral compass the whole thing just falls apart and you have people being murdered and pillage happening and people stealing everybody it's kind of every man for himself or in the, in the computer gaming world, we call this FFA, right? Victor free for all. All right? That's, you know, you get in the game, you start deciding we're going to do teams or FFA. All right? Free for all. That's what happens in, in the show. And so there's a lot of violence. Well, not a lot of violence, but there's some violence. And, and there's a lot of selfishness happening because of this very thing right here. That, that we don't rid ourselves of moral filth. Uh, we don't rid ourselves of evil excess. We, we react to things. We become angry, we become fearful. And so rather than live out the principles that Jesus taught us, we kind of succumb to the ways of the flesh and we kind of down spiral, just like when civilization collapses and there's anarchy. 
And we don't even have to watch a fictional TV show like this. We can look and see what's happening in South Africa. We can look and see what's happening in the Middle East. And we know what happens when anarchy uh, comes into, into being. And there's death. There's disaster. There's suffering of innocent people. And it's all caused because of this next statement. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself. So we hear and know what we, what we ought to do and how we ought to live, but we fail to live it out. And truthfully, it gets really hard. You know, it's easy on a really great day where everything's going our way and nobody's making us mad, quote unquote. Then we can live those things out a lot easier, right? Then when things aren't going our way, when money's tight, when bad things happen to us, when we're treated unfairly, it's really hard in those moments. It's really hard not to be just a hearer, but a doer. But you know, we're a nation of hearers, aren't we? We hear a lot, even, even church people, Christians, they hear a lot of good things. And they come to church on Sunday and they sit and listen to a long, boring sermon. Well, hopefully not boring, but, you know, sometimes it can be. And they do the right thing, maybe, in some cases. But when they go back to work on Monday, they go back to school on Monday where it's time to go out on Sunday night. It's just like everything they just heard never existed. And they live a completely different life. And I would say, I would say, not in a judgmental way, but just in a matter-of-fact way, that's, that's not what Christianity is. That's not what followers of God do. You either follow Christ and it's demonstrated in your life, or you don't. And Revelation says you're either hot or cold. Lukewarm doesn't count for anything. Hearing doesn't count. We have to respond and do. And that's hard because we, we tend to be a little lazy. We tend to gravitate to the status quo, which isn't always bad. But when the status quo is just doing what feels good, what feels right, just living that selfish life, then it's a problem. Because we can see, I mean, if you watch this TV show for 10 minutes, you can see right away that when everybody does their own thing and everybody does what they want to do and it's a free-for-all and an every man for himself, people are going to die. And bad things are going to happen. And so it's not like God's up there and he's going, oh, you know, what can I do to make humans miserable? Oh, I'm going to have all these rules. I'm going to come up with all these things. Not at all. Not at all. God sits up in his throne in heaven and, and he has compassion on us and, and he sees our suffering. He sees the problems that we have. And he says, what can I do to help them? What can I do to ease their suffering? I'll warn them. I'll caution them. Just like you would if you were a parent and your child is about to touch a hot stove or they're standing too close to the edge of something or they don't know how to swim and they start taking off for the pool. We warn them, Right? We don't just kind of sit there like, oh, you know, go kill yourself. No, we warn them. And they don't always listen, just like we don't always listen. But that's how God is, because he cares, and he wants the best for us. The best, not just to survive in life. He wants the best for us. He wants us to thrive. So don't settle for surviving, but decide to thrive. Let's go on. Because, and this is verse 23, because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, here's what he's like. Okay, so this is an analogy, all right, or a parallelism. Here's what he's like. He's like a man looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and right away he forgets what kind of man he was. All right, now think about that for a minute. Right? In fact, the mirror part kind of stands out to me because if, if you uh, have watched Once Upon a Time, you probably noticed that one of the characters, the guy that's actually the mirror on the wall in Once Upon a Time, is that the black guy that, that's in Revolution. He's one of the, he starts out as a, as a general in the Monroe Republic. He later changes allegiance. But um, I kind of think of that mirror, when, it, when I read this verse, I kind of think of that mirror, mirror on the wall since I've also uh, watched uh, Once Upon a Time. And so when we, we look in that mirror and we're kind of like the, the evil queen, right? We want the mirror to tell us what we like to hear rather than the, who we really are. And so in other words, this verse isn't saying like we just kind of dumbly forget what we, what we saw. What the verse is saying is that we make a decision. We choose to establish who we are in our minds 
And then we turn and we walk away from that with the way that we live. So that's what that analogy is like. That's like what that man is like, or woman. You know, I think sometimes, if, if you're not aware of this, uh, in the old days, in the ancient days, like when the, the annals of the world were written in, in some of the early history, they it used the word mankind, right? Now, that's politically incorrect. Hopefully, you all realize that. You say humankind. Hello? I mean, seriously. Um, but back in the old days, they said mankind. Now, was that because they were sexist and because they didn't think that women should be referenced? No. Well, I'm sure there were some people that were sexist. But that term actually is talking about everybody, right? And the reason that word wasn't humankind in the beginning is because in the beginning God created man and then from the man he created woman, right? So they're linked together. They're the same. I mean, they're not the same, but in this sense, they're the same. Everybody with me? So when we see that word mankind, don't get all, you know, up, riled up, you know, ladies or, you know, guys that are, you know, kind of in that deal. It's, it's all good. No offense is intended. We're talking about people. Mankind, humankind, same thing. I'm still going to use the politically correct form because I don't want to offend anybody, but, you know. Okay, so when we, when we fall into that category and we're like this person here, then we know that we're being disobedient to the calling of Christ. That we're living our life in a way that is not pleasing to God. It is not the way that we ought to be living. Let's go on. Verse 25. The one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer who acts this, pers who acts, this person will be blessed in what he does. All right, so we have some interesting words. Perfect law of freedom. It's interesting. Because that would suggest maybe there's an imperfect law. And then perseveres. And then not a forgetful here. I think those are all important elements. So let's just let's kind of break uh, these down briefly. So if you look intently into the perfect law of freedom and you persevere in it, then what are you doing? I mean, think about that for a minute. So there's a lot of laws, isn't there? There's a law of sin and death, right? Jesus talks about the law. Paul talks about the law of sin and death. So that's just simply the way that we live. So when we're born, the natural law for us is to sin. That's just, that's what we naturally do. Now, does that mean we're not good at all? No, that doesn't mean that, I mean, there's some good in us because we're created in the image of God. But we choose to sin, and so, because we're tempted, because there's free will, then we fall into that. And so that's one law. But whenever we make a decision to live by the perfect law, the good law, that separates us away from the law of sin and death, then we are right with God. But there's perseverance. And I don't think anyone in this room who has ever for a, a moment that tried to live a life pleasing to God has not experienced that phenomenon of persevering. Because we are existing in a, in a lawless world. It's like the characters in the TV show. You know, they probably, while not Christians, there is a, a theme of moral goodness in the main characters, at least in most of them, right? That they have a goal to help people, to overthrow a tyrannical government, to restore a civilization. And so there's this moral good that is at work, and they're acting in spite of the law of anarchy. Right? And that's generally the premise for the, for the main characters, why they do a lot of things that they do. And so they're fighting against these evil characters, you know, that are trying to dominate people and, and exploit them and take advantage of them. And so there's this warring of laws. And there are, we see our, our heroes and our heroines in the show go through a lot of hardship. And some of them are killed. And so perseverance is most certainly a prerequisite. But then, what about the forgetful hearer? See, the forgetful hearer is like the person that looks in the mirror and they walk away and they forget. See, that's the forgetful hearer because that person hears truth. They recognize it as truth. But somehow there's a, there's a disconnect there. You know, it's kind, of like, it's kind of like your computer or some gadget that you have and you know what it's supposed to do and you've been trained on it, and maybe you, you read the manual, or you went through training somewhere, you went to college, learned to use the software, but then all of a sudden, somehow, you sit down, and it, it's just not working right. Which, usually, it's user error, okay? So let's all just man up. 
It's not that the computer is broken, okay? It's because we're broken, all right? Because we didn't accurately remember what we're supposed to do, and now we're stuck, all right? It's not, wor it's not working right is our perspective. The reality is we're not using it right, okay? Not always, but, but often this is the case. So, right, John? Where's John at? John Marshall, is he in here? Okay, all right, there you go. John does this for a living. He helps people with their computers, and uh, we've had this conversation before, although he's so generous and kind. He says, oh, no, no, you know, it's, it's the computers, blah, 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 but I know the truth. It's the people. He's just a patient, nice guy. Now, let's, let's see what happens here. So there's a blessing offered for those that will persevere. And in verse 26, if anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue, but deceiving his heart, his religion is useless. All right, so we kind of have a summative statement about this last part, don't we? That basically it's saying that your outward appearance of religion, or your statement of, well, oh, I'm a Christian, or oh, I'm a Baptist, or oh, I'm Assemblies of God, or oh, I'm whatever you claim to be, Lutheran, Methodist, you know, Buddhist, I don't know, whatever you claim to be, whenever that is an empty statement. Whenever your actions don't back up what you're claiming with your mouth, then it is useless. All right? And a useless tool needs to be thrown in the trash. Right? Because if it doesn't, if it has no use, then leaving it to sit in the garage for 20 years is not helpful. I'm mostly talking to myself, but for some of you that have messy garages like me, okay, most of you, then be challenged to get rid of those useless tools. So we must be challenged to get rid of those useless actions in our life. Because it's really the same thing. Verse 27, Pure and undefiled religion before our God and Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep, someone, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. All right, we got any kids in the audience today? All right, let's have kids come up here on the stage. Come and, and we'll try not to destroy anything, Aaron. Why don't you come up here and let's just kind of, maybe if you guys will sit right down here. I need you guys to kind of help, help me with something, all right? Can you guys help me with something? Oh, we have a lot of kids, great. Hey, you guys are doing a really good job listening out there. I saw a lot of you guys sitting still and not fidgeting. That's a really good job. Okay, now guys, here's, the, here's my problem, okay? My problem is um, we have these, these adults over here sitting on there. Can you guys look at the, the adults? And just get, can you do, give, them, give them a look of pity? Can you just give them you know, a look of pity? Because you know what? They're, the, they're hearers right now. You know, they're hearers. You know, we're talking about hearers and doers. Right now, they're just hearers. Isn't that sad? Can, can you just give them a look of pity and sadness? Yeah. Okay. So here's what we need to do. We need to come up with a way to encourage them to not only be hearers, but to be what? Doers. Doers. All right. Doers. Okay. Now, that's really important. Now, Let's let's help them. Let's give some examples because you know sometimes, you know, adults they just need to kind of have it brought down a little bit, you know, because they just they don't always get it, you know. I mean, you ever had that problem? Your your mom they they just don't get it sometimes. I mean, I say that respectfully because we love them, we honor them, and and we respect them. But sometimes, you know, it's just, what are they saying? You know. Okay. So all right. So I want you guys to help me think of some ways to help them be doers. What, what are some ways that you could be a doer this week? Who's got an idea? Listen. Okay, listen. Listen to what? People talking. Okay, good. All right. Being quick to listen, right? And that was in our verse earlier, in verse 19, wasn't it? Okay, what else? What are some other ways? Slow to anger. Okay, be slow to anger. Good. All right, good. So whenever you are told to go clean your room, instead of having a fit, you're going to do what? Go clean your room. Man, you guys are so smart. Yeah. You know, get, give the adults another look of sadness because, you know, they're just, we love them, but they're just hearers, you know. And you guys are doers, aren't you? I mean, you guys are doers, right? You're going to do these things as we go. Okay, good. What are some other ways that we can help the adults over there be doers? Yeah. Tell them to be doers. Okay, so we can encourage them, all right, respectfully, right? Not just ordering them around, you know, mom, dad, go 
cook me breakfast, okay, right? Not like that. But what's a better way even than maybe telling them? What would be a way to, to show them how to be doer? What would you need to do? Make it for them. Make it for them. Okay, so you guys be doers, right? Because if you go out and you show them what a doer is, maybe they'll be reminded that they're supposed to be doers too, is he? Uh. Did you forget? Okay, that's okay. That happens. All right. So what I need you guys to do is to, to help, help the adults this week. I want you guys to be doers, all right? Serve people. Serve your parents. You know, love people at school. Find that kid on the playground that's kind of lonely, everybody's mean to, and go be friends with them. And you guys be doers and live that out so that maybe the people that see you living that out, you, you will be, uh, be blessed, like in our verse, right? Can you guys do that for me? Everybody, okay, let's everybody get a hand in here because it's commitment time. Okay, get a hand, everybody. Come on, Lily. See if you can reach in there. Okay, all right. So on three, we're going to say do, okay? One, two, three, do. All right, good job. Okay, you guys go sit down. Thanks for that help. All right, let's, let's give them the, the adults one more look of pity there. Yeah, yeah, we, we feel sad for them. But they're gonna, we're going to be doers, and we're going to encourage them. All right, thanks, guys. That was a lot of help. I can, I can see already that the attitude's changing, and uh, now all the adults are going to be doers too. This is great. So I think that's an interesting statement. Now, instead of making some kind of world-changing, you know, go and make disciples of all nations kind of statement, instead we see look after the orphans and widows. Now, what, what is unique about orphans and widows that, that would cause us to need to look after them? Okay, all right, so they're, they're alone, by and large. Um, they kind of have a, maybe have had experienced loss, you know, loss of a spouse, loss of parents. Uh, when we were in Ukraine, um, this last time we weren't able to go to orphanages, but uh, several times before that, because we don't have orphanages like that here, um, it really has an impact on me when I go and I see all these children and they're just desperate for a hug, desperate for someone just to look at them, to recognize that they exist, is, I, I mean, it, it is so invaluable to, to them. And for us, you know, we, we take that for granted uh, so much. And so I think what Jesus is saying is that we are responsible to be that moral good. We are responsible to be that light in the darkness that light in our culture to be the heroes and the heroines just like we see in the show to be those people that in spite of the unfairness and how your boss treats you or all these you know things we could we could list as excuses for why we're not slow to speak and slow to become angry why we don't want to listen instead of making excuses for all those things we need to step out and say, you know, in spite of this, in spite of the hardship, in spite of the difficulty, in spite of what I don't have, I'm going to follow Christ. I'm going to serve Him faithfully. This, uh, tomorrow is Veterans Day, and being a, a student of history, I take... Um, holidays like that and Memorial Day, Independence Day, pretty seriously. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't stereotype me as one of those kind of like gunslinging Christians, although I kind of am a gunslinging Christian because I am a Christian and I sling guns. Well, I shoot guns. I don't know if that's slinging necessarily. But um, I, I wouldn't say that it's, you know, this kind of God and country mentality. As much as it is, I recognize that there is a cost for things. Nothing is free. There really is no free lunch. Everything has to be brought into balance. There has to be a price paid for something to be gained. And so I, I realize, I have these moments as I, I read, as I watch documentaries, as I talk to family members, I talk to people in church that have spent time in World War II, in Korea, in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq and many many other places there there's a great sacrifice that is involved there's a sacrifice of the man or woman that's in uniform there's a sacrifice of the family uh, in many words there's a sacrifice of a culture who give up 
uh, the comforts of life for a time um, so that we can be free. Last week we mentioned, um, when we we're talking about the film and some of the elements of the film, we, me- we kind of mentioned, and it, you know, maybe it was a little bit of a controversial, controversial statement, that sometimes as a nation, uh, being a superpower means that we have responsibility to take care of orphans and widows. I mean, in a very literal sense. Um, in fact, I watched, uh, I don't think I mentioned this last week, I actually watched a documentary, it's on Netflix, and it's called The World Without the U.S. And it, it, it's kind of a what if, you know, what if all of a sudden the U.S. just disappeared? Or we just said, you know, we're just going to mind our own business and we're not going to interfere in the world. And I was shocked at how quickly the rest of the world would be plunged into chaos. We are keeping Western and Eastern Europe from being overrun. We are keeping peace in the Middle East. We are keeping peace in Africa and South America. It would be a disaster. And I'm not necessarily making a case, oh, you know, we should be everywhere and mess and meddle in every, every country's business. I'm not making that case. But what I'm saying is we have a responsibility to be the people as believers, as a nation that was used to be founded on God, a constitution that used to be respected and, and, and be the rule of law. We that uphold those values, we ought to be the ones that keep it all from falling apart, to be that moral goodness. To be like the characters, although they're not perfect, just like we're not perfect, uh, that fight against tyranny, that fight against poverty and loneliness and, and lostness in our culture and in cultures that are far, far, far away. But yet again, we're brought back to the problem that where we started is that anyone can be a hearer, but we have to decide to be doers. And I think it's such a hard thing because the cost of hearing is small. Now you might say, well, you know, I had to give up football this afternoon. I had to give up, you know, whatever you're, you know, I don't know, something to get here, to be here. And so we might feel like, you know, we just survived the ultimate rough river uh, on a boat to just to get to church, just to get to small group, to get to, you know, whatever, you know, Bible study. And yet, that's really the easiest part. I mean, just getting here and hearing, right? I mean, even for me, I'm really not any better than a hearer right now because I'm, I'm just repeating basically in kind of my own way and with my own slant on things of, of James and, and the Holy Spirit as he uses James to communicate to your early church and to communicate to us. So we can't just stop with the easy part. We have to move forward and become doers. And I think for some of us, we, we might become arrogant and prideful and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm a doer. You know, I do things. I do good things. I went, I went to Ukraine this year. Uh, I went to Suriname last year. I went to Nebraska. I went to, you know, you fill in the blank. I went down to Victory Mission. I went to Least of these. You know, when you start making excuses for how we're doers and forget to look in the mirror and remember who we really are. And to remember that there's a cost for everything. And are we willing to pay the price that is required? Like so many men and women that have come before us, that have, that have basically created the, the potentiality for us to be here together in this room right now. Because they have defended, fought for, and defended our freedom, we can be here and we can enjoy this time. Many of our brothers and sisters cannot do that. I know that's hard for us to imagine. And there may become a time in our nation where we cannot do that. But as for right now, we can. And so I think that we demonstrate our appreciation, our thankfulness for that. Because it is the season of Thanksgiving after all. By being doers and not just hearers. And that would you come and begin to play. And I think we're, we're kind of stuck with a little bit of a choice here. Because we have to move past the hearing stage. And our kids are going to lead the way for us this week. And so let's be looking at them and let's see what they do. Let's see if they take that challenge seriously. But let's look inwardly at ourselves. 
let's not think about our spouse, let's not think about our kids, our parents, let's not think about our co-workers for just a minute, and let's just think about ourselves. I'm going to ask every, every person in here to, to close their eyes and bow their heads. Nobody looking around, nobody on their phone, let's just, let's just take a moment. Let's let it just be us and the Lord. Let's just have a moment of truthfulness. And let's just look into that mirror and let's let's just for a moment let, let God tell us who we really are. I believe that each of us at this very moment, we have things in our life that we need to repent of. That just simply means we need to turn away from some choices that we're making and go in a different direction. The opposite direction. So I want you to just capture for just a minute those few, maybe just a few things that the Lord's brought to your mind just to grab those things. And to make a decision not just to hear the Lord speaking to you today, but to actually turn away and to make a significant change in these areas of your life, regardless of the cost. Let's pray together. Lord, I just thank you so much um, that you have called many to come home with you on a battlefield far away they were killed for my freedom and if that weren't enough Lord on a hill far away at Golgotha you paid the ultimate price for my sin and even while I was lost in that sin and I hated you and I had wanted nothing to do with you you had compassion on me and you reached down and you delivered me. God, today I pray that as a church, as men and women and children of God, that we would come humbly before your throne today. And that the things that are in our life that need to be changed, that, that once and for all, Lord, you would just give us the strength to make those changes. That no longer would we make excuses, no longer would we be hearers only, but we would become doers. And therefore, true followers of Christ. And I pray for your strength, I pray for your compassion, that you would give us the perseverance that we lack, that you would give us the courage that we lack to face these challenges in our life, that we wouldn't become discouraged, that we wouldn't give up hope, that we would follow you in obedience, believing all things, even if they seem impossible, knowing that your promises are true. And we just thank you and ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.